Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I thought I'd also show you, um, this is our hospital. It looks like an industrial <laughs> center or something. We are a technical university, but this is actually our hospital. And we evaluated the role of super or the prognostic uh, relevance of super in a medical ICU setting. Uh, of course, you all uh, know this, what super means, the soluble um, UVR receptor that you can detect. And our idea was um, if we have high circulating super levels, it might tell us something about um, the origin of uh, critical disease or the prognosis in case of in terms of mortality. And we had this uh, idea from Jesper in mind, showing in distinct diseases that very severely ill patients show very high levels of super, and we would like to confirm that in a cohort of patients uh, at the medical ICU that suffer from different uh, critical illnesses. And what we also had in mind when we started our study was that apparently there were data showing that in septic patients mortality is, can be predicted by super, but also that infection doesn't seem to be the, the real clue to uh, understand the function of super in critical illness as patients without infection, but um, uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome also show high super levels. So we conducted a study in which we included prospectively 273 patients that had been admitted to our medical ICU and um, this is very similar to what you saw from um, the last presentation. A lot of these patients had sepsis but of course, we're also, I guess, a northern country. We had a lot of pneumonia in, in our severely ill patients. And about one third of the patients had non septic origin, like cardiopulmonary diseases or decompensated liver cirrhosis. And uh, we assessed super levels at day one, like right at admission to our ICU, and then day three and day seven during the follow up. And we followed the patient not only at as long as they were at the ICU to assess um, short-term mortality. We also attempted to reach every patient about one year later by contacting the general practitioner or by contacting the patients to really see um, the long-term follow-up that we could maybe predict with super. And we were actually surprised how many patients die afterwards. Uh, they have been discharged, which is a very sad thing, but tells you something about the severity of disease about one third or a quarter to a third of the patients die during ICU, but about half of the patients are dead after one year in the, in the long run. Of course, we are very happy to confirm uh, the, the general dogma that um, super levels are very low in healthy controls and have, uh, are dramatically increased in the critically ill patients. Um, this is like for the total group of patients and I put the median and that looks very close to the Danish blood donors um, to us. And if we uh, divide them into um, patients with sepsis or SIRS and no SIRS, we see increased levels in sepsis, but there's a big overlap. And what we found interesting is that especially patients with decompensated liver cirrhosis seem to have very high super levels, which of course makes us wonder if there's a special function uh, of the liver to it, and um, I guess the data from Finland that we saw this morning uh, look very similar from um, Staph aureus sepsis. When we asked ourselves, is super a good marker to predict if a patient has sepsis, meaning an infectious complication, uh, which could you could imagine that this could, this could affect the outcome, um, although the patients ha with sepsis had higher levels than non-septic patients, we have better markers to predict uh, the presence of uh, um, sepsis or infectious complications. As here, if you compare with CRP or procalcitonin levels, super is really inferior in predicting, in predicting sepsis. Another observation that we did, uh, that we had, and this is also very similar to the Greek study, and uh, I'm very happy to see those data, is that super is very high uh, if you admit a patient to an ICU, but it also stays very high. It has a, apparently a long half-life and doesn't really change a lot. And this was true for sepsis and non-sepsis patient. 
And uh, even if we test uh, individually with the Wilcoxon test, um, there's no difference. It doesn't change uh, in the, within the patients within the first week of intensive care treatment. In order to understand what, what SUPER tells us, what it's related to, we also performed extensive correlation analyses and found, of course, on one hand, that SUPER correlates well with inflammatory markers, for instance, the um, C-reactive protein, but also procalcitonin or TNF-alpha levels. But what we also noticed was that SUPER was closely related to organ function, for instance, here liver function, if we assess it by pseudocholine esterase levels or albumin or international normalized ratio, you see if the liver function goes down, super levels go up. The same for the renal function. If we see patients with renal failure with very low GFR, super levels tend to increase. So altogether it tells us that super is very much elevated in patients that are critically ill. We see that it's closely related to inflammation, to organ function, and it's not a good marker to predict sepsis. It seems to predict severity of disease, and of course, um, then we, we address the question, does it predict outcome? And uh, I guess after one day at the ICU, for those of you who don't work in the clinics, like all patients look more or less like, like this lady, ventilated, sedated with vasopressors, with a PICO system to monitor hemodynamics, um, with parenteral and enteral nutrition and fluid management. And um, a lot of these patients unfortunately die, but some also like this lady, she's still ventilated, but at least we'll get her off the ventilator also soon. And uh, she is probably thinking our oh, life is super. <laughs> but can we predict mortality? in these patients or predict the outcome of these patients? And the answer is very similar to what we saw from, from Greece, that the patients that will die later in, during the ICU um, have much higher levels of super upon admission, and this holds true on day three and day seven as well. And if we plot couple of you see that uh, later on day three, day seven, we lose a lot of patients that either get discharged to the regular ward or that, that die in the follow-up. But if we plot the Kaplan-Meier curves, we can really see patients that, have, that belong to the, the group of the upper quartile of super levels really differ from the rest with respect to mortality. And this is the ICU mortality, so short-term mortality, if you wish. <laughs> The same is true if we take the super level and on day three, where it actually splits up even a little bit nicer. If we want to nail it down to a number, uh, to define a threshold, um, we, we can say at admission, we got the best discrimination between survivors and non-survivors using a cutoff super level of eight. And on day three, we used the cutoff level of 13, which gave us the best discrimination between both conditions, survivors and non-survivors. As I told you, ICU mortality is only one, one part of the coin, and the other is um, how the patients do on the long run. And also super um, discriminates quite well between patients that die uh, or stay alive during the long-term follow-up. So if we compare here, and you see the rate of survivors and deaths is about equal, we have... Um, super levels taken at admission, day three or day seven, and you see higher levels in the patients that will die at least on admission and day three. And the same set of plots again, that the patients with the upper 25% super levels really do very, very poorly on the outcome. And you see here, it's, um, of course, for, for two, three years, we have only limited data, so it's, um, it's not really certain if it really drops here again, but you see that on the long run, high super is really bad, either taken um, at admission or on day three. And same if we use the cutoff of eight for admission super or uh, 13 for the day three super, we get a very good discrimination um, between patients that survive or that will die, die in the follow-up. If we compare super to other biomarkers, um, we have to say that if we use single biomarkers, the super really seems to do better than, for instance, CRP or procalcitonin 
albumin or creatinine, um, both on the ICU survival as well as overall survival. If we compare it to established clinical scores that uh, reflect um, disease severity, for instance, the Apache score, the SEPS2 score, or the SOFA score, uh, we see that these composite, uh, composite clinical scores perform um, a little bit better than, than super overall. So I guess the way is really um, to, to uh, combine super into an integrated model if you really want to predict outcome much better. So in, to summarize, we have conducted a single center study in the medical ICU setting and found that uh, super levels are highly increased in, um, in critically ill patients. They are especially increased in sepsis, but do not really seem to predict the occurrence of sepsis very well. Um, it's closely related to inflammation, but also to organ dysfunction. And um, maybe this has to do with the route of clearance. So um, it doesn't seem to be so easy that it's just like um, cleared by the kidneys immediately because it would not really explain the kinetics but maybe it's something that renal and hepatic function uh, determine the clearance rate of super. And what we find very convincing is that super is a very strong predictor of ICU and of overall mortality in critically ill patients. And I would like to thank the people who performed the study. Uh, this is Dr. Alexander Koch, who is the head of the ICU department, um, who did a lot of the work this is uh, my laboratory who's working on, on inflammatory disease models, mostly in mice uh, and liver diseases and liver fibrosis. And of course, we thank very much uh, Jesper and Hendrik for providing us with the kits. Thank you very much. Thank you.